Well, good morning, Ridgecrest. We're going to try that one more time so we can all be together and awake for our second hour of worship. Good morning, Ridgecrest. There we go. We're so glad that you're here today with us to worship Jesus and to praise his name for who he is. And we're also very excited to begin our service this morning with Believer's Baptism. And we have two coming today to say that Jesus is their Lord and Savior and to let their church family know that. Our first is Lucas. This is Lucas Bond, and today is not only the day that he's getting baptized, but it's his 14th birthday. And so what a special day to... Yeah, they're going to clap for you. What a special moment on his 14th birthday to remember um, and to always look back and know that Jesus has changed his life. And he's here again to let his church family know that he's made that decision. If you're here today, maybe friends or family of Lucas and you support his decision today, would you stand for just a moment so you can recognize, be recognized? We can't see them, but they're out there, okay? <laughs> you can be seated. So Lucas, we're so excited for you and proud of your decision today. As we think of what you've done, my question for you is, who is Jesus to you? So because of that, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our second is Arian. sister joined our church recently and we had the opportunity miss jessica in our children's ministry to talk to arian about her decision of following jesus and we nailed that down and today she's coming to say yes and to let her church family know that through believers baptism so arian who is jesus to you Amen. it's because of that i baptize you in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit Amen. Isn't that awesome? That's my favorite way to start a service. Come on, let's stand together this morning and let's sing about God's goodness together. Sing it out.
That's right, believe it today. All over my life, I see your promises. evidence is here, amen? He's a good God. And I know that that can sometimes, I remember when I was growing up, we had this thing at, at my church that the, the, the pastor or someone would come up on the stage and say, God is good. And we would say, all the time. And they would say, and all the time, God is good. That's right. You know it. And we believe that and we know it's true. But those words, if we're not careful, can become such a I don't want to say a cliche. It's not, it's not a cliche to believe that God is good, but just to say those words, well, God is good. But what does that really mean? That can be a heavy statement. You might be walking through some heartache or some pain or some moments of being unsure in your life, and it, it might be kind of difficult to say, God is good. But this is a new song that we're going to do today, and it says, you are good, and you can only be good. You can't be anything else. So I just want to encourage you this morning that God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. If he wasn't good, he wouldn't be God. And that doesn't mean that we're not going to walk through things that are difficult, because good is not my definition of that word. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life. I can see it. I can. But I have to be looking for it. I have to be thanking the Lord. I have to be aware of where I've been and what he's bringing me through. And I have to be looking to him at all times and all things and all ways. And so today I want you to realize that to believe in your heart and to say God is good and to really say it, I, I really believe that that's one of the most effective ways that we can participate in spiritual warfare. When we believe that God is good and we can say, I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life and, and you're, you can only be good. When we say that and when we believe it, it makes the enemy go, what? Don't you see all the ways that I'm trying to show you how he's, how he's not good? Don't you see all the ways that I'm, I'm trying to be an influence and, and say, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. What do you mean God is good? It doesn't make any sense to him. So today, I want to encourage you. That's what our whole worship set is about this morning, is seeing the evidence of God's goodness, knowing that he's at work, knowing that he is doing things. And today, I just want to encourage the ones in the room that might not really feel that, that might be struggling in some way with something, declare it today that God is good and believe it in your heart because he is. You might not be able to see it right now. And for those of you that, that don't have, for, we all have different seasons. For the ones that say, man, I'm living it right now. I can see it. I see God's goodness. He's at work all around me and I'm so aware of it. 
If that's you today, I just want to invite you to sing at the top of your lungs a word of praise to the Lord that he is good and let him know that you believe it today. This is a brand new song called Good, You Can't Be Anything Else. And I want you to hear it today. Trust your promise. I've never seen you turn away. You have loved me undeserving. Oh, I have seen your mercy. Follow me all my days. Oh, it doesn't make sense how your love is so good. You called me your friend and I thought I was too far gone. Now I know you're never gonna let me go. You are good and you can only be good. You can't be anything else. You can't be believe that today no matter what you're walking through no matter what the enemy is telling you God is good amen hear this In hindsight's always 2020 oh I can look behind me and see just how far I've gone Save me from the brink of falling Mercy shutting doors before me And now I see all the good you've done But When it doesn't make sense and the future's unsure I look at my past and I see you there all along Now I know you're never gonna
one last time, hear this. Oh, it doesn't make sense how your love is so good. You called me your friend and I thought I was too far gone. Now I know you're never gonna let me go. Oh, my. 
response to these songs that we've worshiped together this morning, let's pray across this room. With every head bowed and eyes closed just for a moment to focus, I want to encourage you right there in the stillness of this moment and the quietness of your heart to say thank you, God, for your faithfulness. Thank you, God, for your goodness. Then also right there, ask God to strengthen you to be faithful to him. Say, God, because of your faithfulness, help me today to say yes to you, to be faithful to whatever it is you're calling me to do. Father, first and foremost, we do come to you this morning and we praise you and we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your goodness and we understand that that's simply who you are. So help us, God, not to have eyes that see circumstances, but God, eyes that see those circumstances through your plan and your purpose and your goodness. Father, as well this morning, we pray for strength for each of us to not only experience your faithfulness, but to walk in faithfulness to you, to say yes to you, as we've seen too this morning that are obedient in baptism, just as an example, to say yes to you, to be faithful as you lead us each day, to be obedient to the specific things that you've put in front of us to make a difference for your glory and for your honor. God, thank you for this challenge this morning, reminder of your goodness and faithfulness, faithfulness to us. God, we pray now for this time as we transition and study your word. God, may it just continue to be a heart of worship. That we'd be eager this morning to hear from your word. The one true living God that spoke the world into motion also will speak to us today. So may we believe that this morning. God, open our hearts and our ears to hear from you this morning. Anoint the words of our pastor and allow his words to be from you. And then God, strengthen us to be obedient as you lead us through your word to do specific things. Father, we thank you that you're in this room with us. We believe that. Thank you for the ability to worship you this morning. God, we just honor and praise your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You be seated this morning. And welcome to Ridgecrest. We're so thankful that you're here. We're so excited for what the Lord is doing in this room, but all throughout our church. And we're thankful again that you're a part of that. If you're a guest of ours this morning, we want to say a special welcome to you. Maybe today's your first time at Ridgecrest, and we'd love to hear from you so that we can reach out to you in the days ahead and get more information to you about our church. The first way, if you're a guest of ours, that you can let us know who you are is by filling out the Next Steps card. It's in the worship folder that looks like this on your that you received on your way in. It's on the back page there. If you'll tear that Next Steps card out, you can do two things with it. You can drop in the offering baskets as you leave, but we'd rather you bring that Next Steps card to the Welcome Center. We had a couple people do that after our first hour of worship, and we were able to greet them and talk to them about our church and give them a gift bag. And so if you are a guest of ours, you can bring that Next Steps card to the Welcome Center right after the service. You can also, if you're a guest of ours today, scan the QR code, which is in the rack right there on the seat in front of you. And as you scan that QR code, you'll receive a form directly back to your phone there that will allow you to fill out some information and give us some details and we'll reach out to you as well in the days ahead. I need to make two specific notes before we check out RBC3. The first is tonight at five o'clock. We're excited to be back here in this room for our one family worship time together. It's gonna to be a special time right here in this room at five for worship. And then we'll have a fellowship in the RFC, in the fitness center immediately following. So make plans now, bring your family, you come on back tonight for one family worship as we join both our first hour and second hour and worship Jesus together. We'd love to have you. And then secondly, just a reminder, our Ridgecrest Academy of Discipleship, our women's ministry and our men's ministry have multiple discipleship opportunities for you to dive deeper and to study God's word in a more intimate way. And so we'd love for you to get signed up. Some of those groups start this next um, Sunday, a week from today, Sunday afternoon next week at five o'clock, and then some will start the following Wednesday. So get signed up. There's a table in the Welcome Center that gives you all those details and we can answer any questions you may have. Again, we're excited you're here today at Ridgecrest. If you'll turn your attention now to RBC3 on the screens.
Hi, Ridgecrest. I'm Britton Jones, and I have three minutes to let you know what is happening here and how you can get connected. This is RBC3. Something powerful happens when God's people get together for a time of dedicated prayer, especially when it involves an entire city. You have an opportunity to join believers from all over the Circle City, Wednesday, September 21st at 6 p.m. at the Dothan Civic Center for a prayer event simply known as Pray Dothan. It is always a good time to gather with other believers, but even more so during this time in which we are living. There will be no services here on campus on the 21st, so please consider coming to the Dothan Civic Center at 6 p.m. to join others at Pray Dothan. We have also just begun a grief support group that meets right here in the Welcome Center each Tuesday morning from 8.30 until 10. If you have lost a loved one, you will be ministered to by others who are experiencing loss just as you are. This is also an opportunity for you to come alongside others and minister to them as well. The group is facilitated by our Ridgecrest resident counselor, Reggie Brookins. The group meets each Tuesday and no registration is required. For more information, contact Kelly Golden here at the church. Finally, Ridgecrest, do you consider yourself a creative? Do you like to work with your hands, create digital art, work with wood, write or draw? We would love to help you use your creativity for the glory of God. That's why we're having a Call to Creatives Vision Meeting Thursday, September 22nd, beginning at 6 p.m. in the upstairs meeting room above the fitness center. If you consider yourself created in any way, we would love to collaborate with you and glorify God in the process. There is no registration necessary. The meeting will be facilitated by Kelly Groves, for more information, see Recreation Minister Lance Griffin. So Ridgecrest, come as you are to Pray Dothan, Wednesday, September 21st at 6 p.m. at the Dothan Civic Center. Attend our grief support group each Tuesday at 8.30 a.m. at the Welcome Center. And come to our Creatives Vision Meeting Thursday, September 22nd at 6 p.m. in the Upstairs Meeting Room. Now, you're all caught up. I'm Britton Jones, and you've been watching RBC3. if you will take your Bibles and open up to the book of Revelation chapter 3 that's where we're going to be this morning while you're finding your place there let me just reiterate what Chase has already said about tonight one family worship uh, it's been a while since we've been able to do those and uh, man they're great it'll combine the music of both the first service and our praise band uh, in the second and then tonight we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper five o'clock in here then after the service we're going to move over to the uh, RFC for a time of food and fellowship, and so it's designed for your entire family. I hope you'll be a part of that uh, this evening, 5 o'clock in here, Lord's Supper, special music, and uh, a brief message, and then we'll head across to the fellowship uh, hall. Now today I want to continue in our series, Seven Churches, Seven Choices, and I want to talk about the fifth church of the seven. This is the church at Sardis. And uh, I had a man after the first service come up and said, Pastor, he said, you know, going through these churches, he said, when you look at them and examine them, it's almost like the culture we're living in today. I said, exactly. I said, in fact, it's identical. The culture of these churches uh, that they were dealing with and they were facing is exactly like the culture that we are in uh, today. And now, <clears throat> and so that's why they're so relevant uh, for us. How many of you know the term phishing when it comes to email? P H I S H I N G, phishing. Yeah, yeah, everybody know that pretty much in here? I don't know, maybe you've been a victim. How many of you have been some kind of victim or you received a, a phishing email? 
If you email, you probably have. I mean, I'd be stunned if you haven't. And you know what phishing is. Phishing is when somebody, you know, uh, sends you an email, and the email looks a whole lot like uh, it's legitimate, and it might even take you to a web page that looks legitimate, and then, you know what they do, they ask you to put in, like, credit card information or personal information or PIN numbers and all that, and I hope you're smart enough to kind of pick up on those. There are a lot of people who have been scammed by that, which is actually why it began as kind of a nuisance thing, but it's now turned to international... uh, uh, crime. I mean, it's become that big. In fact, it is frequently operated uh, by uh, kind of mafiaistic kinds of groups in other uh, countries, uh, as well as, of course, uh, America. And so, but what it does is it capitalizes on the reputation of something that you trust, right? It, it looks good. Uh, it seems good. It seems like everything's in place. By the way, over the last probably 10 years, uh, some of you may have even received an email supposedly from me. Uh, We've received, our staff has received them, our financial office has received them, and I know some members uh, off and on, it seems like it goes in seasons where there'll be an email from me, which is not actually from me, but it's phishing, and it will say, uh, this is Pastor Ray, and uh, I've got a financial need, and I need you to, could you help me? And then the email will do something like this, and there's been so many different versions of it that it would, it would say, uh, the best way to help me is to, to purchase gift cards and then mail them to this address, and would you keep that between us? And uh, <laughs> I've actually had people in the church that decided not to mail them, but they showed up at my office and, and said, Pastor, we got your email. And I said, good. (laughs) No, I said, what email? And then they would tell me what it was. I had one dear couple in this church, and they showed up, and they had had several hundred dollars worth of gift cards in a bag. And they said, well, here here are the gift cards you needed. And they said, said, uh, we decided instead of sending them to the address, we would just bring them to you. And I said, thank you. (laughs) How many hundred did you say that is? Uh, And I said, oh, no. I said, oh, gosh. I said, no. I said, I didn't send that email out. And I said, you you take that and keep that money or spend that money or whatever. But I said, I "I, I don't need that. That's a scam is what it is. And uh, we'd, we'd get them in our financial. In fact, our financial office began to joke because they would get one that would say, sent to the financial secretary, this is Pastor Ray, and I need a check in this amount made out to another name or entity and mailed to this. There's a need that I'm not at liberty to talk about. I just need you to do this, mail it to this address in this name, and then let's keep that quiet. And at first, they would come. I had a staff member come to me one time and say, I got your email. And I said, I didn't send one. <laughs> and he was so sincere. He said, I don't have much, Pastor, but he said, I'll do my best to help you. I said, oh, man, you, you know, that kind of stuff, fishing. You know. By the way, if you ever get one of those uh, from me, all right, don't, don't mail any gift cards to anybody. Just bring them to me. <laughs> <Right? laughs> no. Uh, but, I mean, we all understand it. What that is, you know, what it's designed to do is to, to take advantage of uh, uh, an image of, like, the church or a reputation of the church or hopefully a good reputation of a pastor or something like that. It is, it is designed, it's fraud designed to masquerade as legitimate uh, uh, truth based on reputation or that sort of stuff but the fact is our world's full of that kind of stuff isn't it it's full of impersonators it's full of frauds it's full of 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 people who are trying to create a persona or a false image or a phony reputation and try to to live off of that i read recently uh an article that told about a british designer who has created what he believes is the world's first inflatable church i'm serious and it stands 47 feet high from its base to the, to the top of its temple 
Uh, and the, it's a, a great kind of plastic structure. It can be carried around the back of a pickup truck. It includes a blown up pulpit. It includes a blown up organ, a blown up altar, these inflatable Gothic uh, arches and inflatable uh, fake stained glass windows. And I don't know how their sales have been about it, but it's just, it's an image, but it's not really the real deal. And um, there are a lot of people uh, today that are part of what you might call a kind of a blown up church image. Uh, you know, they and the church have the appearance of, of, of spirituality on the outside, but on the inside, it's just plastic. And that's really what we've got going on with the church of Sardis. It has this image uh, to the, the world about it. It has a reputation before the world, but what's going on on the inside is nothing. In fact, Jesus knows what's the tru- uh, what the truth is about the church, and the church is, he says, dead. So I want to talk about that church this morning. Would you stand with me? as we examine the superficial church of Sardis. Look, beginning in verse 1, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Quote, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Father, let us hear this morning your message to us. Father, the message that you gave to Sardis, Father, speak to us from this message and teach us and instruct us and confront us and convict us, God, and most of all, transform us, Father, through the lessons and the truths of your word. We ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Now, let me give you some background on the church of Sardis. I've done this with each of the churches we've looked at, and just so you can have some perspective about this particular church. Sardis, the city of Sardis, or even the region, if you will, of Sardis, was a historically significant area. The city was significant. It was located southeast of Thyatira. That's the church we looked at last week. It's about 50 miles from the church at Smyrna. It had an Acropolis that rose about 1,500 feet high above the city area. It made a perfect military citadel for protection and was a military outpost like some of the other churches we had talked about. It was one of the ancient world's most powerful cities, and it set along this commerce route referred to as um, the, the Royal Road, the Persian Royal Road. In other words, it was a mega commerce route that was used in that in that era. Uh, but it had come under Roman rule now, and some of its glory days had passed. It was still a thriving area of commerce. Uh, it was still important to trade just because of its location, but its great prestigious past had kind of, kind of faltered a, a bit. They were living off of the history of their city, and they were still uh, providing a means of commerce. Uh, by the way, it was a city in AD 17. A devastating earthquake uh, leveled the city, and it rose back up because Tiberius, the Roman emperor, decided to rebuild it because it was on this trade route, and he poured what we would say today were millions upon millions upon millions and millions of dollars to restore and rebuild um, uh, the city of, of Sardis, and so it could thrive again. Sardis was so grateful that the emperor had, had brought them back to life that they actually, uh, to show their gratitude, they established a emperor cult. You know, I told you a little bit about that last week where they would worship the emperor. They would see the emperor like one of the gods. And so Sardis, because they said, we want to let Tiberius know how, how grateful we are for his rebuilding our, our city. And so they began to worship 
um, uh, uh, Tiberias there. And th like the other cities, there were numerous temples. This was common in this uh, entire uh, Asia Minor region. There were all these different te temples. Chief among them in Sardis, however, was the temple to Artemis. Temple Artemis was considered a place where you would go to uh, if you needed uh, uh, healing. It was a place to, to go to this temple and, and worship there, so to speak, these pagan gods, uh, the pagan god of Artemis. And they built this temple, uh, which was considered the fourth largest uh, ancient temple constructed uh, in the ancient world. It was massive there. They were known for that. And, uh, and so it was just a, another expression of the kind of uh, paganism. There was a large Jewish population in Sardis. Uh, there had been a diaspora earlier, that is a dispersing of the Jews, and the Romans had, uh, had uh, uh, moved a great number of Jews to the the region of Sardis, and so there was a large Jewish population there, and it was an extremely wealthy area. There's a river uh, right near Sardis, and they found gold in the river, and so it was extremely wealthy. Uh, it was a prosperous city because of, of that and because of the trade, but the problem for the church at Sardis is that it had become so fully compromised by the pagan environment uh, around it that the, the Christian church at Sardis was Christian only in name because they had become so compliant, so complicit, and so compatible with the spirit of the age. And so, uh, and so they looked a whole lot like the rest of the, the worship experiences of the day. Now, this church, by the way, you know, seven churches, and you've noticed even the worst of them you've already noticed that there still were some commendable things about them. Remember, so this, I know that you've done this, and you've been good about this, you've patiently endured, and all of that kind of stuff. And then Jesus would say to them, but I have this against you. Do you know the church at Sardis of the seven churches, now listen to this, it's the only one that is not commended for anything. It's not commended for anything. Now, it has some commendable people. He said, I know that there are a few who haven't soiled their garments. They haven't compromised the truth. They're still living and walking with it. But the church itself is not commended for anything. It's the only one of the seven that's not commended for anything. Now, that tells you how serious the condition was there. And here's the deal. They really believed they were in good shape. He says, I know you have a reputation for being alive, but I also know this. You're not really alive. You're dead. So they had convinced themselves that they must be a pretty good church because, because they kind of, the culture liked them. Think about that. The culture liked them. Now, I tell you where I'm not going. I'm not going to say, well, the culture shouldn't like the church. That's not the point. The point is, they, like the other churches who were being uh, persecuted and were suffering because of their, their stance for the Lord Jesus Christ, the church at Sardis wasn't. They were not being persecuted. They were not suffering. They, they kind of just got along with everybody. And, uh, and listen, there's a lesson for us there. If you get along with everybody, you're probably, you've probably had to compromise somewhere. Right? And I, I, this message is not about not getting along with people, but it is about learning where you bend and where you don't bend. See? And so with that in mind, let me show you three things about the church at Sardis. Number one, Sardis was reputationally deceptive. Reputationally, they were deceptive. They had this reputation, but it wasn't the real truth about who they were. It was a deceptive reputation. Jesus said you have the reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Uh, and as a result of that, the church at Sardis came under the most severe kind of denunciation of all the seven churches. Uh, as I said again, it wasn't being harassed, it wasn't persecuted, it wasn't being bullied. <clears throat> but the reason that it comes under such severe denunciation by Jesus is because it had so... Um, it had become so compatible with the world, you couldn't distinguish it from the world. Does that make sense? It looked just like the world. 
It just looked just like the other faiths. And you remember the thing about, I've told you this, remember this, this is so important when you think about the early church and, and why they were persecuted and suffering. The reason it didn't suffer, as I said, is because it was compatible with the culture. And the reason it was compatible with the culture is it didn't mind going along and saying, well, one God is as good as another. Now, that is the culture we're living in today, isn't it? That says, you know, you got your way, we got our way. One God, doesn't matter which God, any God will get you to the same destination ultimately. That's kind of what our world says. Well, that's what the, uh, the climate that Sardis was living in, and they had gone along with that. They have said, yeah, that's okay. So, oh, you go over to this pagan temple? Well, great. I hope you have a great pagan wor worship experience. You go to this one? I hope you have a great pagan worship experience. That's kind of the church at Sardis. We just want to get along, and we want to be compatible. We want to be respected. And so the community, the culture of, the, of Sardis looked at them and said, Hey, the, Sardis, that's a pretty good church over there. They do their thing. We do our thing. And, and everybody just kind of is compatible in their uh, understanding of uh, uh, faith and religion. But their reputation, that was their reputation, but their reputation was not a representation of the truth. They seemed to be alive, they seemed to be thriving, but the truth was they were compromised and they were spiritually dead. And Jesus knew, knew that. And by the way, Jesus knows that about us. You see, a lot of times we can be like the church of Sardis. I was praying this morning and one of the things I asked the Lord as I studied back through the message for today, I said, Lord, don't let me be Sardis. Lord, don't let me become Sardis. Because it happens subtly, you know. You don't realize, and one day you think, you know what, I, I'm no different than the culture that doesn't know God. I just have a, a religious facade. I just have a Christian facade in front of me. And maybe that's something we all should but Jesus knows the truth about us. See, he knew the truth about Sardis. He says, but I know. And Jesus looks at our life and says, I know. And maybe sometimes we will say, yeah, God, but I obviously don't know. God, make it, make it known to me. They retained this outward appearance of life, but they had no spiritual pulse. And, and there were really, really, you might say there were two reasons for that. You ready? Here they are. Reason number one is because they deceived others about Christianity. They deceived others. They had developed a reputation, as I said, of compatibility. We're just like all the other religions. They, and here's what will cause that. They came to like being liked. They came to like being liked. Now, again, the goal isn't to get people to dislike <laughs> You, you know, the goal isn't to say, well, if I can get people to dislike me, that must mean I have uh, authentic Christianity. No, it might just mean you're, you've got the spiritual gift of irritation. That's what it might mean. The go Paul even said, as much as is possible uh, for you, live at peace with all men. Now, he said, as much as is possible, and we know it wasn't always possible, Paul's life is an example of that. The world will not always uh, affirm what you believe, all right? And so when that happens, you have to say, well, I, like Martin Luther said at the, the um, uh, church at Wittenberg, here I stand, my, my conscience is held captive to the word of God. I can, I, and he tacked these 95 theses, he says, I can do no more, I have to stand on the word of God. Even if it puts me, by the way, at odds with the rig religious establishment of the day, if it puts me at odds with the culture of the day, that's what he said. And so, so while we, our goal is to, to live at peace as, as much as possible, sometimes Paul said the gospel is an offense. And listen to what Jesus said. He said, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. That's what Jesus said. So there are going to be occasions where people might not like you. And our goal must not be, I've got to get everybody to like me so they will like Jesus. Are y'all with me? Because sometimes, you see, it's just incompatible. Now, 
I'm not fussing at the world. Look, look, don't get angry at, the, at a lost world for acting lost. If they're lost, they're not going to understand some of these things. And that'll give you some perspective when you understand sometimes why they hate uh, the faith. And so the expectation that you can live for Christ without compromise and then be loved and affirmed and accepted by the world just isn't going to happen over the long haul, all right? The goal for us is to be pleasing to God, not pleasing to people. Does that make sense? Now, again, remember, that doesn't mean you say, well, I'm going to try to be distasteful to people. No, no. The goal is to quit worrying about people from that perspective and to be focused on being pleasing to God so that God looks at us and says, you know, you're pleasing to me. You, you were pleasing to me. Some years ago with a sweet lady in the church, and she, she had terminal cancer, and she loved God with all her heart, and she, had, she, had, she was going through this battle with cancer. And one morning we were going to have her give her testimony, and I'm, I'm right here, um, and she's right over here. And while we're worshiping, the Lord just really moved in my heart uh, and said, you go tell her she's pleasing to me. And I thought, well, God, we're right in the middle. You know, I just you know, walk over there and say, I need to tell you something. But it just was so strong. And finally, I thought, okay, Lord, I, I'll tell her. And I walked from here, walked over here, just not far away. And I said, I said to her, I called her name, and I said, I want to tell you something. The Lord wants you to know that you are pleasing to him. And, man, she began to sob. And she said, that's what I needed to hear that's what I needed to hear see the goal is to be pleasing to God and by the way remember when they when they asked Jesus what's the great commandment do y'all y'all remember somebody tell me what was the great commandment love the Lord your God with all your what class heart soul mind strength that's number one and then do you remember what the second one that's vertical right you remember what the second one was was Love your neighbor as you love yourself, right? Now, here's the point. If you focus on pleasing God, guess what? You'll get the second one right. But if you try to please people first, you'll miss this one. That's why Jesus, by the way, sometimes Jesus makes statements you say, well, there's no particular order here, but there is when it comes to that. Love God first, love your neighbor second. But you can't love your neighbor second and then love God. you got to get the order right, okay? So <clears throat> here's what was going on in the church of Sardis. It might be going on in your life. That you were, so, uh, you were so concerned about pleasing other people that you got your eyes off of pleasing Jesus. And I'll tell you, it's hard, isn't it? I may be doing a series down the road on fear been working on it privately do a message or two on the fear of man the fear of God the fear of the enemy we got thinking about you know something the other day about the fear of man you know the Bible says fear of man is a snare it's a trap but it's so powerful in terms of controlling us and what happens is when we're more concerned about what does what do people think of us then we'll quit focusing on what God thinks of us. You, you see, the order is pretty important. Well, let me move on. So we don't have anything in common with the pagan gods of the age. And you say, well, they had idols and they had temples to these pagan gods. You know what? We have idols and temples sometimes that replace God, don't we? Um. By the way, there were a lot of people in temples yesterday to football teams. Um, you know, a little tongue-in-cheek there. But we have a lot of gods in our culture, don't we? We have a lot of things that, that transplant God sometimes in our life. And I'm not saying fo football, duh, it can, but especially in this state. Right? I mean, it can. 
It can become something that drives us and controls us and, 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 and gives us highs and lows. By the way, if you want highs and lows, in this state yesterday, you had the opportunity. <laughs> right? But sometimes that kind of stuff we can see, wow, that, that has too much control on my emotions. It has too much control on my mind. So we don't say, well, we don't worship pagan. pagan. Look, there are a lot of gods in this culture. That's just an example of something that can be in our life. You understand? Y'all understand? Look, do like this. I'm going to have to keep preaching this point. <laughs> so what does it mean? What does it mean? Paul said being authentic means this. He says, what agreement has the temple of God by the way, that's us, with idols. For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them, that's us, and walk among them, that's us. I will be their God, that's us, and they shall be my people, that's us. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separated from them, says the Lord. What was he saying? Authentic Christianity, you know what it looks like? It looks different than what's out in the world. And if we look like the world... We need to question our authenticity as a follower of Christ. When we're compatible with the culture's values, when, we are, uh, when our view of the world is no different than the view of the world by those without Christ, then, then guess what? We're at risk of compromise. We're at risk of misrepresenting the gospel and misrepresenting Jesus and misrepresenting the kingdom of God. And when we do that, we're deceiving others about what Christianity is all about. Now, how did that happen at the church at Sardis? How did they get there? Well, really the answer is pretty simple. That's the second consequence that I mentioned or the second reason. Not only did they deceive others about Christianity, the way that they began to do that is because at some point they deceived themselves about Christianity. That is, they allowed themselves to be more influenced by the culture and the cultural convictions than to be shaped by the convictions of God, the, the, the Word of God. And that's why Paul, in this same kind of culture, wrote Romans 12 and verse 2 when he said, Do not be conformed to this world. Have you ever, You've read that verse before. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, and he says, by the renewing of your mind. Why? He says, so you can test and prove what the will of God is. You see, how do you deceive yourself about Christianity? You let the culture shape your mind and your ideas and your convictions. And so Paul says, don't let... The world squeeze you into its mold. In the Greek, that's the idea when it says don't be conformed to the world. The Greek word means don't, don't let the world take you and squeeze you and shape you into its image, but be transformed so that you will be a reflection of the image of Christ and the convictions of God. They deceive themselves, and we do too sometimes. We deceive ourselves. Someone said, I don't know who it was, but they said this, we possess a marvelous capacity for self-deception. And this capacity, the enemy finds to be one of his most effective weapons for destroying the souls of men. Uh, how many of y'all remember the story, uh, the emperor has no clothes? Now, that's not many people. You, do you remember that, the emperor has no clothes? I mean, it's a, it's a children's tale. A lot of people, you heard it when you... If my memory serves me right, it goes something like, uh, like this. Someone persuaded the emperor that he needed a new kind of, of uh, luxury kind of outfit that only people with the most refined kind of taste would, would recognize what kind of, of new fashion he was in. And, and the emperor uh, couldn't see the clothes, nor could anyone else, but... The salesman who persuaded him was lying, and, and so there really were no clothes to be seen. No, but, but no one, you know the story, nobody would say anything about it because no one wanted to admit that they couldn't see the clothes that the emperor was not wearing and the clothes that he had spent a fortune on. So nobody wanted to say, oh, it looks like he has nothing on to me. Oh, what a fine outfit. That's kind of what they, they want. One of my favorite Andy Griffiths is the, 
uh, when they get a, uh, they have this little gathering and they're putting these, the cards down, they're reading these cards and it's Floyd and Goober and Barney. And you need to go watch this particular scene. And so they're trying to see what does the count, Countess Von Telecki, what does he say? And they throw some dust on the flame and it, it kind of explodes up like this. And, and Goober says, boy, the count's active tonight. And, uh, and then uh, Barney says, yes, he's here. And, and Floyd says, do you see him? And he says, do you? And Floyd goes, oh, yeah, if he's here, I see him. Yeah, well, nobody was seeing the count, you know. But, if, but that's a story of the, oh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, what a nice set. Nobody wanted to say because nobody wanted anybody to think that they didn't have a refined sense of fashion. And so because he had a new set of clothes, you know what he did? He arranged for a parade. And the king goes out in his new non-clothes, you know, for a parade. And everybody, oh, the king's new wardrobe. But he's in the raw, people. And uh, he thinks, this is so cool. Look, the people are responding and everything. And, nobody, uh, <clears throat> and no one would say it except for a little boy in the crowd. And, of course, he yells out the truth. He says, hey, the king has no clothes. <gasps> you know, can't believe he said that. You, you can't say it. But, look, it's a child's tale. But do you see it has a great point? It has a great cultural point, doesn't it? That sometimes what happens is we become compatible with the way the culture is, and we go, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, I'm in, uh, yeah, I agree, because nobody wants to say, but here's the truth. Or nobody wants to say this, thus saith the Lord God Almighty. Because, because I don't want people to think less of my reputation, or I don't want them to think, well, you're kind of a little nutty, or, or uh, you, you know, you're a little bit of a Jesus fanatic. By the way, I like the term Jesus freak. You're a little Jesus freaky. I, that's a compliment. Yeah, I am. I had family members that called me a, a Jesus fanatic when I was growing up. Well, they were right. I really was, but they didn't mean it kindly. And I still am, I hope. But <clears throat> you understand that, that when a Christian tries to accommodate the values of the world, they're deceiving themselves in order to get along with the age. Now, frankly, there's nothing wrong with having good reputation. It's certainly better than a bad one. But here's the key. Your reputation is what others think about you. But is it reflective of what Jesus really knows about you? And so you and I have to do business with Jesus, not business with, with those Jesus said, I know your works. I know your works. That's what we're accountable for. Here's the second thing I want you to see about uh, Sardis, and, and that is that Sardis was um, operationally dysfunctional. <clears throat> Verse 2, Jesus says, wake up and strengthen what remains. It's about to die. I have not found your works complete. That's the operative phrase. It was operationally dysfunctional. You're not finished. This is what God was saying. You're not finished. I, you need to wake up because I have put you here on purpose and with purpose, and your works are not complete in my eyes. You see, not only were they spiritually deceptive, they were spiritually dysfunctional. They were, here's what they were doing, class. They were trying to coast spiritually on their past reputation. They were living on their past spirituality. They were not full of the Spirit of God, and they were not walking by faith. They were just, they had a reputation because somewhere back there, they did it right. Somewhere back there, they got it right. But now where they are, they're just kind of living off of that reputation back there. Can I ask you this morning, are you trying to live off of your spiritual reputation that's what they were doing. And people around them said, oh, man, he loves God. She loves God. They, they really, they walk with God. But you know, you know, you know in your heart you go, oh, man, I'm dry as I can be. I'm just trying to survive off of my reputation. I don't want people to know the depths of how dry I am or how unspiritual I am. Jesus knows. 
And that's why he tells them to wake up. You can't live on your spiritual reputation. What was it that gave you that reputation? See, that's a question that you and I have to ask in our own. What was it that produced that reputation to start with? There was something good that produced it. What was it? I can't live off of it, but I can understand what was it that was going on in my life for that period of time where it caused me to walk closely to God and it was noticeable to others. What was it? And have I abandoned it? You know, it's easy the longer you stay in the faith to get the routine in and and not give the the vigilance that you need to give to maintain a dynamic walk with Christ. And they were, and and if you're not, if you're just operating on the past reputation you have, guess what? You're you're dysfunctional spiritually in the present. Because that's not what God, that's not uh, how God has designed it. And Jesus, Jesus' message to them is emphatic. Emphatic. In fact, it's imperative. And he gives them two statements. Number one, wake up. If that's who you are, he said, they all think this about you, but I know the truth about what's going on in you. And, and he says, wake up. Wake up. He says, you think you're alive, but you're dead. Spiritually speaking, there's no spiritual dynamic going on. That's what he's talking about there. So he says, wake up. Now, listen, by the way, I say it too. Wake up. But the dynamic there is is missing. Jesus knows that. He knows that they're empty, they're dry. They're trying to run off of past uh, fumes, um, but it's not running. So he says, wake up. The fact that he says, wake up, means that you can. Think about that. Now, that's something good. If he says you wake up, it means you can. When I was working on the message, I pulled out, I remembered a story I had read back in 2021, and I went back in my files and I had it. It's about a man in India. It was first reported in the the Times of India that this man, he was 45 years old, he was an electrical engineer, and he was out early one evening. He was headed home. He got hit by a motorcycle. It was pretty severe. They rushed him to the hospital. The doctors worked on him for a bit, and then they declared him dead. No, they said he has no heartbeat or anything. They declared him dead. It was in the evening. Since it was in the evening, they were trying to get the family there. The family wouldn't be able to arrive till the next morning. And so they put him, this is in New Delhi, they put him in the mortuary freezer. You know, with all the other cadavers, the bodies, they're all there in the freezer waiting for the family to get there the next morning to identify him and then sign papers releasing them to do an autopsy and remove his organs. So they show up, the family shows up the next morning, they pull him out of the freezer Seven hours he's been in the freezer in the morgue, and he starts moving. <laughs> I had a friend, I, a friend in this church, and I said, what do you want said at your funeral when people walk past your casket? He said, I want somebody to look in and say, hey, he's moving. <laughs> well, in this case, this, this guy is moving. And it's his sister-in-law that sees it, sees him start to twitch and everything, and then his, and she, she yells out, hey, he's moving, and he wants to say something. <laughs> they didn't say what he said. Wouldn't that be a fun kind of meme to caption, you know? What, what, what would you say if you come out of the death freezer? But he awoke. They called the doctors in. They called the police in. <laughs> By the way, some lawsuits were filed Well, Jesus says, wake up. The fact that he says that means you can. That's good news, right? And then the second thing he says, and he's talking about waking up spiritually, and the second thing he says, did you see it there? Strengthen what remains. This is a command. Both of these are commands. And and the idea here in the Greek is to make firm or to solidify your spiritual life. The 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 Greek word here means literally to stand up. It's the idea of planting your feet in your faith firmly. So it makes sense, does it? Wake up. Get sober spiritually. And then stand up. It's the picture of a corpse standing up in new life. 
I'm awake, I get it. And standing firm, not just like, here I stand. (laughs) It's the idea of standing up, standing firm. And so this is what he says to them. He says, look, wake up spiritually and strengthen what remains. And the point was that he was making that if they didn't do that, if they didn't respond, even the very little spiritual vitality that remained would wither up and die. Folks, I want to tell you something. Our faith demands constant vigilance, constant attention, and in every day. Pablo Casals was considered the greatest cellist that ever lived, and when he was 95 years old, he was asked, listen to this, why do you continue to practice six hours a day? And this is what he said. He said, because I finally think I'm making some progress. 95, the greatest cellist that had ever existed, practiced six hours a day. Your spiritual life requires daily attention. And too many Christians start well. They just don't finish well. So let me ask you this before we move to the last thing, and that is do you feel spiritually dry? Is, is it a facade for you? You know, I've got a reputation, and I've got to try to protect that reputation. But inside, I'm dry. I feel disconnected. Many times the culprit is that we stop paying attention to our spiritual life. We stop giving energy to our spiritual growth. We try to live off of what happened uh, in, the ba- uh, in the past. In 3 John, verse 2, there's only one chapter, so 3 John, verse 2, Paul writes to uh, these believers and he said, and this is a paraphrase, but he says, I pray that your physical, uh, physical health is prospering the way your spiritual health is. I've always thought, man, what an interesting statement. I pray that your, your physical health prospers just like your spiritual health. They were known for, for their deep commitment to the Lord. And he's saying, man, if your health, physical health will just prosper as much as your spiritual uh, health, man, you're going to be in really good shape. But then I reversed that and I thought, How would you be, how would I be if our physical health was the same as our spiritual health? There'd be a lot of people on ventilators in the hospital. There'd be a lot of people that were trying to survive if their their physical health was equivalent to their spiritual health. So I ask you, are you growing? Are you awake? And then here's the last thing that I share with you this morning. And I want you to see that Sardis was also informationally disconnected. Verse 3 says, Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. Now, get this, people. Their problem wasn't a spiritual information problem. Their problem was a spiritual memory problem. He said, remember what you've been taught. Remember what you've heard. So easy for us. And we're bombarded by so many voices out there, aren't aren't we? You and I are bombarded by all these voices and all these messages. By the way, time out. That's one of the reasons that gathering with God's people is important for us. Why? Because you're going to go back into the world and you're going to be bombarded with message after message after message after message. And you know what those messengers are doing? They're doing what the world's messages would do. They're they're pulling at your emotions. They're pulling at your mind. They're they're suggesting agendas for you to follow or believe. They're trying to get in your pocketbook or your wallet. This is what those messages do, and they will wrap them so well. And you say, well, I don't fall victim to that. Don't you believe that? They have spent millions of dollars learning how to get into your mind. And so we have all these messages. I'm not fussing about that. I'm just saying that's reality. What I'm saying to you is when you walk out of here, you're going to be bombarded with messages. Back in the 70s, back in the 70s, they did a study of how many ads the average person hears a day. Somebody tell me how many you think it was. Bradley, how many you think? 50 messages. Somebody else in the 70s. Who? 200? Messages a day. Well, 
between 100 and 600 a day. 600 is a high end. And, you know, they surveyed these people and they said to them, said, so how does that feel? And they said, it feels like advertising's out of control. 2007, the Yanklevich uh, Institute, who researches things like this, did a, did a survey uh, of over 4,000 people to, about ads and how many ads are coming through their lives and everything. Now, in the 70s, it was between 100 and 600. By 2007, the number had increased significantly. What was it? It was up to 5,000 ads per day. Boom, 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 boom. That's a, that's a bunch. That's the average. <clears throat> then, in 2021, they did it again. 2021, they discovered that the average person is now estimated to encounter between 6,000 to 10,000 messages a year. No. A, a month. No. A day. 6,000 to 10,000 messages a day. Do you understand the point? What you put in here programs your life. What you put in here programs your mind, programs your heart. And, and so that determines a lot of where you develop your convictions. That's why, that's why this book is so important. You say, but that book will program me. That's right. That's the point. Be transformed by renewing your mind. You know what Paul implies there is that your mind is renewed by the Word of God, with the Spirit of God that resides in you. And listen, the world is programming us. For good or bad, the world is programming us. And if we're not careful, and then we get maybe an hour, maybe two hours a week together, uh, and if you're not feeding yourself in God's Word, you've got a lot of stuff that's going in without taking the truth of God in. And so, so uh, somebody said to me on one occasion, said, well, you know, this is what you people do at the church is you, you indoctrinate people. And listen, the, that's exactly right. And so does the culture. That's exactly right. But I'm not indoctrinating them in the uh, uh, person of Ray. I'm saying, here, I didn't write this book. God wrote this book. Let's see what God says. God has a right to indoctrinate people. He has the right to do that. And by the way, he doesn't have to explain that to us. He doesn't, you know, you can say, well, God, I, you know, I, I don't think what you say should be, because the culture has changed so much, God. So what you're saying, doing goes against the cross grain. Can't you just, God, can't you get along with the culture a little bit better? I could accept, God, your teaching more if it aligned with the spirit of the age, the zeitgeist, the, the opinions of the world. Can't you just make yourself a little more compatible? That was the problem at Sardis. Let's just be compatible. We're bombarded by messages. So, <clears throat> there are a lot of messages, and those messages, if we're not careful, will cause us to try to coexist, live with the world and live with God. Can't we just make them work together? And the fact is, Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. He says, you're going to hate one and love the other. He said, that's just reality. You can't serve two, two masters. So with all these voices and the pull and the tug, how do we connect? How do we reconnect? Well, today... If you feel that you're spiritually dry or spiritually disconnected, let me give you, as I close here, let me give you a couple of things that will help you reconnect. The first thing we must remember, he says that to them there, remember. It, what is it that, that developed the reputation that you have spiritually? You, go back and remember that. What was it that caused that to happen? Um, let's see. How many of you, there are some of you in here that probably remember when the space shuttle 
exploded. How many, probably not tons, but some, yeah, you remember the space shuttle exploded. Do you remember what you were doing when that happened? Do you remember where you were when that happened? Today uh, is the anniversary of 9-11, 21 years ago. I had only been the pastor here a few, just a few months when that happened. How many of you remember 9-11? Some of you, there are a few of you in here, you weren't born, you weren't on the planet yet, or you were very young. How does that make you feel? You remember, how many of you now remember what you were doing when the 9-11 events happened? It's etched in our brain, isn't it? I mean, I was sitting in my study. My wife calls me. I have a little t- television in my study, uh, the study part of my office. My wife calls and says, you need to turn your television on. I turned it on, and the first plane had already hit. I believe it was the South Tower or the North Tower. I believe it was. It hit the North Tower first. And I remember saying that, and I remember thinking, what a, what a tragedy. What a tragedy. And then I was watching when the second one hit, and then I said, this is... This isn't accidental. This is on purpose. And then we all know from there what happened. We remember those things. They're etched in our brain. I remember what I was doing when the space shuttle exploded. I actually am old enough to remember when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And I was a kid. I really was. I was three years old. You say, oh, you didn't. Yes, I do. I don't remember much about being three years old, Chuck. I don't, that, but I remember that. Why? Because my mom was ironing clothes. And they came on the news, and they announced that the president has been, been shot in Dallas. And I remember her reaction, and I think that's what etched it in my, my brain. If you ask me, what else do you remember from being three? I can't tell you. We rem- things like that just set, don't they? And, and we remember them. We, we just we don't forget them. And so uh, a 9-11 changed our world. We don't forget it. We remember what we're doing. Uh, but friend you know what I've noticed the devil has a convenient way of helping us forget the things that count for the most like the cross by the way again it's one of the reasons I want to invite you to be here tonight we'll be talking about the cross we'll be taking the Lord's Supper we'll be singing and celebrating we, we need to do that Jesus said as often as you do this you do this in remember of me until I return why? We need to remember. Remembering is important. And so Jesus tells them to remember. Remember, remember what got you where you are, what you've been taught and what you've heard. Remember and give, and the point is give new energy to it. And then return to God's Word. He said, and receive and keep what, keep what you've heard. Strengthen what you've heard. Strengthen what God's Word says. That's where God's going to speak to you. If you're dry this morning, listen, you remember what was going on in your life that created that spiritual dynamic. and What were you doing? What were your spiritual habits? That sort of stuff. One of them most likely was you were spending time in the Word of God. You weren't just counting on what the preacher said to feed you. I hope it does and, and continues to do so. But you were feeding yourself. And then listen, like all of the churches, he says, repent. Repent, and you know what he said to this one? Repent or else. He said, if you don't repent, I'm coming. And he wasn't talking about the second coming. He was, coming, he was talking about the discipline he was going to bring upon them. He said, I'm going to do it when you don't know. It's going to be fast. It's going to be swift. You're not going to expect it. Repent of any sin that he reveals. That's where restoration happens. You can remember what was going on. You can, you can remain in the Word of God, but friend, until you say, God, I'm going to repent of the stuff that I have uh, tolerated and put up with in my life, the fact is, until you repent, nothing much will change in your life. If, there, if there's sin that you need to repent of. And then you relinquish, you relinquish control of your life to the Holy Spirit. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but it is Christ who lives in me. Christ in me, the hope of glory. I relinquish control. You know, most of the time when I look at my life and I look at the the dumb things I've done, the dumb things that I've I've, uh, said, and the dumb times where I have 
I walked in my flesh. You know what it is a result of? It's a result of me trying to live for God instead of letting God live the life through me. And that's what, he, that's what the Scripture tells us. Relinquish control of the Holy Spirit. Not I that live, but Christ that lives in me. I've been crucified to myself. That means I have died to me so that Christ could live through me. So what's the lesson here this morning? The lesson is this, stay on mission. That's what he was telling them. The stuff you've heard, the stuff that you've been taught, stay with that, stick with that, strengthen that, and be eternally vigilant. Until he comes, until he comes, we continue to walk by faith. We continue to trust his word. We continue to follow and obey him. And we continue to daily give energy to our relationship, attention to our relationship with him. Eternal vigilance. You remember back there, but you have to be vigilant today. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you uh, that when you told them to wake up, they could. Maybe not if they stayed that way, they wouldn't, but they could. And Father, I pray for any that are watching by live stream or in this live audience, Father, that needs to wake up, would you with your spirit bring conviction in their hearts and cause them to say, God, I need to wake up. I want to wake up. I don't want to just go back and remember. I want to remember and I want to return and I want to be restored and I want to strengthen what's still there and follow you with all my heart. I want to be authentic and not just a person of reputation. Lord, would you help those that are there Father, for others that may need to just start at the basic place, and that is that they need to call on you to be their Savior. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Help them to call on you today. And if that's you, you're listening, television, live stream, radio, in this live audience, you can call on him right now. You can say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. I know that I'm a sinner. I know I've messed up. I know I've blown it. But you died for my sins. I thank you. You died because you love me. I thank you for that. And I ask you to come into my life to forgive me. You've promised you would. I know you will. And give me new life in you. Now, Father, you've heard the prayers. You've heard, uh, Father, our confessions to you this morning. We pray now, Father, that you'll help us take the next steps for our sake and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me for our invitation before we're gone this morning? I'll be here at the front. We'll have staff members on the other aisles. If there's a decision for you to make, a decision you can say, what is that? Well, you know, you can use that tear-off panel. It's in your worship folder. You can check some decision. Maybe you pray to receive Christ or something of that nature. You want to join Ridgecrest or whatever it is. But I want to urge you instead to just come to one of us and let us take care of that for you. And so as we begin to sing in a moment, will you slip out from where you are, balcony, ground floor, come this way, you want to join Ridgecrest, or you say, I prayed that prayer to trust Christ, or I need to be baptized like people were baptized today, or I just want to come down here and pray around this altar. I'm praying for somebody. I'm praying about something. And I want to lay that before the Lord. This altar is open. Are you ready? As Bradley leads us right now, you slip out. Come on.